Well, hello, everybody. We got a show here for you and a special guest today. From my perspective, he's right over here. <laughs> hey, guys. Yeah, it's Jim Bishop. Yep. Jim. The, the one and only. The one and only. Jim Bishop. The yeah. Bishop. <laughs> the Bishop. So uh, great to have you with us, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Your Glad neighbor. to. And thanks, for, thanks for accommodating me. I know uh, you, we tried to do this a, a week ago, but I had flown back to the U.S. and just wasn't going to be able to do it. <laughs> I, I liked your response, though, saying your your family time was going to be valuable because you were back in the States. <laughs> well, so my like, so my, my daughters live back in the U.S., so um, my wife and I will be here for probably another two years. And we don't get to get out back as often as we'd like. Um, my oldest daughter is pregnant with our first grandchild, and so we wanted wow. to spend some time with that. Um, yeah. I, needed to, I needed to help paint the um, new nursery and set stuff up <laughs> and whatnot. So I just I had to make sure yeah. that I was there for them. I invite you, you to remind her that Jeffrey is a very beautiful name for a boy. I, I tried several times to get Jim, but she decided on Charlie. So I, I don't I don't win that. Is that Kibler then, named after Kibler? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I told her that Charlie was spelled J-I-M, but she didn't fall for yeah. that either. Yeah, kids are smart these days. They catch yeah. up. You know, so they got all the internet and all that stuff, and we, yeah, all we had was books, right? So yeah, they've got that interweb. Yeah. So how is it? Uh, you're in Germany. How, how so my wife and I came here for work. Um, we both supported the federal government, uh, but. You know, like I said earlier, I retired in March of last year, um, mainly because my wife and I tend to bump into each other at work and it causes um, ethical conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. And so my wife still works here and then uh, I retired. Ah. And now I do nothing. And have you been there a long time? <laughs> so, so we've been here for, it was two years last January. So we've been here about two and a half years. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, we got here just in time for COVID. We came here to do a lot of traveling and got here just in time for COVID to kick off. And so, as you know, traveling disappears <laughs> during that period of time. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, things have loosened up here in Germany over the last six to eight months. Um, it got, you know, possible to move around with a, you know, Europeans have a COVID passport basically for all of EU. And so if you had your passport, you could move around. Um, to some extent, and so that allowed me to get out to like Copenhagen and a couple places for ASL tournaments, the UK and whatnot. But now things are loosening up pretty effectively, and it's pretty easy to get around. And where in Germany? I'm just curious because my wife is German. So I live uh, south central Germany in Stuttgart. Oh, okay. So, yeah, uh, she's from yeah. Wiesbaden. Yeah. While I was stationed in Wiesbaden, I was in the army in the 80s. So we spent three years there. Uh, yeah. I love it. We're about, you know, 35, 40 minutes from France, um, about two or three hours from Italy, and go through Italy to, to get to Switzerland in about four and a half, five hours, less than five hours from Poland, Vienna, Austria in about two hours. You know, coincidentally, Dave and I live about two or three hours from a good Italian restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> well, I bet you it's not as good as the Italian restaurant that's just about 10 minutes from here. Yeah, probably. Because <laughs> uh, they have a couple of Italian guys that opened up an Italian store that's not far from here. They make this great brick oven pizza. Really amazing. Well, yes, thank you. We'd love to come and we'll right, be. You're, you're, you're welcome. If you can get here, <laughs> let me know. I'll get a spare so, bedroom in the other room. <laughs> I gotta, I'm going to go get my passport. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you could uh, start by telling us a little of your uh, gaming background and ASL background. So like most people, I started playing squad leader as a kid. Um, my brother and I were playing it by dumping counters on the board and making machine gun and tank noises like, you know, everybody else. Um, I went off to university and started playing there a little bit. And, you know, at about that time, ASL came out. So I was playing squad leader primarily and ASL comes out. So I bought you know, the rule book and probably up through west of Alamein, but I didn't really play it much. And then uh, I got shipped to the army over in over Germany. Um, and so when I was in the army, there was just nobody to play. I didn't have my stuff with me. I left it all in storage. And then my wife and I got married, came back to the U.S. I got out of the army right around 2000, sometime in that time frame. Um, and I was looking to just get rid of my ASL stuff. So I went and looked on eBay. And obviously on eBay, it's going for some pricing. And I'm like, hmm, well, if people are buying it, then people are playing it. So let's take a look and see. And 
uh, local search. I lived in Washington, D.C., hit the D.C. conscripts. You know, you found out I lived right next to Gary Fortenberry, so Gary Fortenberry became my primary opponent that I played. Um, and, you know, now the rest is history. I played like 100, 150 games a year, you know, usually once or twice a week. Um, Vazel play, PBEM play, you name it, I played it. And so at this point in time, you know, I've been playing it for roughly 30 years, and I've got roughly 3,000, 3,500 games played. Oh, you're ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, I've, pl- I've played quite a bit. Uh, uh, but I, I'm sad to say, or happy to say, depending on how you look at it, and all that time I've never once played a cave scenario or Pangees, but. Yeah. <laughs> I think I read that on your blog, yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, 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 it's not that I have anything against them. I just, I don't know, I, I'm just not a big fan. Uh, you know, I don't play CGs either. To me, that's like 3,000 turns of the same scenario. I just don't have it in me. I, how many how many 30 up threes can you take in, in, in a lifetime? You know, oh, here, this is a daring move, assault move. This this one's way bolder, assault move, but into plus two ten. I just, I, I don't have it. I just can't do it. And and never did. It was never your cup of tea, you, th- you think? So I've tried. Um, so there's a couple of things that set me off on CGs. Uh, like, I don't like playing CGs against somebody who's played it 35 times, right? Mm-hmm. The, the fastest way to get me to quit a CG is to look at me and say, you know, I did that to Tom 32 years ago. Uh, I'm like, okay, well, if you've played it that much that you remember and know all the LOSs, then I'm just not interested. It's just, it's no fun for me to sit here and have you laughing at me because I'm doing the same stupid stuff that, you know, you did when you first started out. Uh, I, I already know I'm dumb. I don't need you to tell me I'm dumb. <laughs> And so, you know, I just don't play them. I, occasionally I'll play, like, I like the um, the Hatton CG because it was short and crisp and yeah, features some maneuver. And I've seen the one that, um, uh, what's his name uh, from MMP? Uh, golly, I can't remember his name. He's the the, guy, the starter kit guy. But he's doing a uh, Hazel that's a lot more open with maneuverability around Normandy. Um, Ken Dunn, and uh, I like the look of that one. I saw that one a couple times at the MMP play test. That to me looks interesting because there's room for maneuver, and uh, it's not. I mean, the map was the same size as what was inside of like um, KF uh, Kampf Group Piper, but it wasn't closed in. It was open, and so there was room for maneuver. There were fields of fire. Um, there was interesting to it to me. So that one I think has has potential. Um, I'm looking, I'm kind of looking forward to that one. But, you know, I buy them all. I don't know why. They're all sitting back there in boxes still, not even yeah. open. Yeah, that's what I do too. And I've only played, well, maybe two or three, yeah, could be four. But the only thing I enjoy most is being together with friends, you know, for yeah. that month yeah. and month and a half. And then put it away and then get back to, the like you, just doing the quicker stuff and stuff with, yeah, because like the Stalingrad, I can't really get, just firing across the street yeah i mean describing you know it's just gets it gets crazy to me when you're playing you know look after this third cg date i've got four 10 minus threes and all of my machine guns happen to be lined up on top of them yeah i I just i I mean if you enjoy it that's fine i you know i it takes all forms but i would rather have something a little bit more maneuver a little bit you know just more more into it than just assault moving across the street, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to have tanks and airplanes. And I mean, infantry games can have maneuver, and I and those are fine. I like those a lot. Um, but you know, just this idea that you sit up, you sit across the street and you blast each other out, right? Or and then in the defensive fire phase, you just skulk everybody out and skulk everybody back. It's like, how about we just skip my defensive turn so we don't have to move yeah. all these counters around? <laughs> So, well, but yeah, it do, it does, and it takes a longer time to finally punch a hole somewhere where someone can start to pour in. But yeah, yeah. and I, um, and I imagine that there's probably some reality to it, right? I mean, it's fought over a bigger space, and you're looking at battalion size formations instead of company size formations, and you know it's an interesting tactical space. Uh, but you know, I don't know. It's just not my gig. It's not my cup. Of, I'd rather play Texas Flood in a big scenario like that then play a CG, right? I, I don't mind playing first bid or last bid, right? It's just a big game across the whole map. I don't have any problem with that. I just can't do 300 turns of the same thing. Yeah, and so, then you keep pouring forces in, so it's kind of yeah. like, you know. And, and it's and it's interesting because um, 
So I've been doing a lot of thought. I read Toby Pilling's article on ASL defense. And so I liked it a lot. And what, I, what struck me about it is how similar his approach is to mine. And uh, I use different terminology. So I've been writing an article talking about my approach to defense. Um, and one of the things that I realized was is that I, you know, I wanted to go to the literature and see what was out there and in, in defending on in, in that space. And the period literature from 1940s doesn't really have a whole lot on defending, but modern literature um, really struck me as interesting because first of all, it's all ba battalion based. So as we sit here and talk about con you know, our company based game um, and how that all plays together, uh, I was surprised that the defensive patterns that I was using uh, were you know, trenched in modern theory. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see, uh, you know, Toby and I sort of independently came together at the same sort of idea, um, but just with a little bit different approach to it and and then have it, you know, repute, not repudiated, um, validated in modern literature. Mm. Um, so it was just, that was kind of something unusual to me coming out of a game. It just seemed kind of weird. And what is Toby's last name again? Toby Pilling. Um, so Toby is probably... He's definitely top 10 ASL player in the world. I'm not exactly sure where he is in that pantheon. I know he's probably the number one player in Europe that I'm aware of. Um, he's a really good guy. And he wrote a really good article in uh, uh, LFT 11, I think it is. And so it was a really decent one. Um, his uh, defensive article in LFT 11 prompted my offensive article in LFT 12. So the, that just was printed and has just started shipping. Um, and so that's why uh, on my website, if you visit it, there's that um, art, the latest article is a list because that article was originally going to be on my blog. And when you go from a blog medium to a print medium, you lose all the links and all the space. And so that small article was just an idea to put all the links in place so people could go find what I'm referring to. Now, is that from the seller 12? Yeah, from the yeah. seller 12. I yeah. think it's 12. I, I have to open it up. Yeah, it's 12. Yeah, because I don't have it yet. Um, yeah. 11, Toby's article 11 is really good, but, um, and I really liked it, but now I feel like I have to write my own, not because I think I can do better, but because, um, so as a programmer and a person with a, a background in programming, um, we break things down in what's called design patterns. And so when you have a complex problem, you break it down into small pieces and small subroutines. And then those routines are answered by design patterns. And if you put enough design patterns together, a lot outcomes in Microsoft Office, right? And so uh, I, I do something similar to what Toby talks about moving platoons. I think of them in terms of design patterns and strong points and, and, and mission statements and things for those different groups. Um, very similar to what Toby does, but uh, by putting it in the words in my mind in that way, then I start also thinking, okay, well, if this is, if I'm using a, a linear defense, then I don't want to be defending against tanks because once they push through the linear defense, there's no way their speed is too fast on me. And if I'm in a linear defense, then I want to use my obstacles in this way, or if I'm denying terrain or I'm doing defense in depth. And so it's this whole bit. Um, as, I've, as I write more and more, I find that my articles tend to become almost like related and intertwined, right? Because you know, obviously we're talking about one thing, but I start to see how they all become a framework and how maybe at some point in time when I finally get done writing, I may go ahead and edit them all together into like almost like an ASL book right? or a chapter by chapter or, or break them into sections and start with an article on attacking and then all my attacking based articles and an article on defense and all my defense based articles and talk about how they come together. Because I do think there's something about it. Um, I'm still teasing it out in my head how that looks, but I do think there's something to it. I like the idea, and you've got time. Yeah, I've got I've got plenty of time. Uh, like I'm writing. A, I got a. I heard listening to some guys. So I play with the guys from uh, Aberdeen every Friday night. We do a online Vazo. We all somebody picks the scenario, and then we all play it. And it's usually four to six guys or six to eight guys playing the same scenario, and then we'll sit down. And we'll talk about it afterwards. And uh, Again, somebody said to me, well, it's just a it's a plus one die roll modifier. So it's a shift on a column one to the right or one to the left. And I'm like, no, that's not the case. Mathematically, um, those minuses are way more powerful than the pluses. And then showing them how that means and how that works out, uh, it just leads me to believe that it would be my next article. 
um, talking about, you know, show me, show me how an, uh, a six plus one gets a KIA and I'll show you how a six minus one gets a KIA, right? And, and just talking about it, because I think people tend to focus on that diagonal line, you know, eight on the eight, seven on the seven, six on the four, and they don't think about the low end of that table. And that low end of the table is where all the damage is at. And those negative modifiers get you down there. So that's probably going to be what I write about next. We'll see. I got a couple other ideas banging around in my head. Now, earlier in this interview, did you say you were not smart? I thought I heard you say. Well, I'm not. I'm not always. A, I'm not a dummy. No, I'm, certainly, I'm certainly not well, a dummy. But Jeff but, and I are. So we're just yeah. sitting here going like, "Holy we just crap!" Not, we just have to turn the microphones up. Any, anybody, anybody who's playing SL is not a dummy. Um, well, I guess, yeah, we are college graduates, but exactly. Well, <laughs> American college that doesn't say much, right? <laughs> Right. And I was remember, an art major, so remember, remember John Belushi with a shirt that said "College." <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's very. I, I understand the principles. I know that the then obviously running in the open, just oh, it's devastating. Um, right. But yeah, getting an extra plus one, I guess, in just the woods doesn't always seem to be that big of a deal. But um, yeah, to to win the game, you really got to break these people and half squat them right. and. Right. So, and, and and so a lot of times what I talk about uh, and what I've been trying to talk. So I've been doing a little bit more teaching lately than I have been playing, um, and I try to tell folks that you know the, the more units have been killed in ASL for failure to route than have ever been killed with a KIA. Uh, yeah. Right. And so and so that is predicated on maneuver. And so as as powerful as it is to want to sit across the table, and this gets back to the CGs, right, and just at each other. That's just not that has no maneuver to it. And that's where that's where the power in the game is, is, is getting around and maneuvering and putting yourself in a position to unhinge defenses by flanking fire or, or aggressive play. Um, and so, that, yeah. That's, and I hate yeah. it when my friend Dave Timonen that I had been teaching for years and years I remember when he first started to run around my broken guys and right, catch right. them like I was doing to him. Right, right. <laughs> like, darn you. Yeah, you hate it when they learn. Right? Yeah. You're, not, you're not supposed to learn, at least not against me. Go yeah. take it someplace else. Now, I, I was playing one today, and and so uh, Andy Bagley and I have been playing a scenario, and we've spread it out over two weeks because I went back to the U.S. And uh, in five turns, I rolled eight fours, which was his sniper, he rolled six activations out of the eight possible snipers, and of his six activations, all sixes were all six were ones. Right. And out of his ones, two hit tanks and recalled them, and oh. three three hit leaders who were in stacks. So not only did they hit the stack, they had to select the guy out there in the stack against my American units who were six six sixes, which uh. meant they all broke on the leader lost task checks. Yeah, leader lost task check. and it was. <laughs> And I'm like, come on, how are you supposed to play like this? <laughs> you know, and then someone someone says to me, you got you got to account for those kinds of things and take it. I said, okay, so I have to mm. account for that. So let's do the math. Yeah. One in one in six, six times is one in two thousand, plus one in two, six more times is like one in fifty thousand. <laughs> I'm like, and so that doesn't even take in the direction and distance accountability to it because I don't even know what that is. I'm like, but I, yeah, I should probably account for that one in forty million. Well, I was thinking button up those tanks, but other than that, you can't stop. It. Well, I mean, <laughs> and so I know there's penalties to there, that. There's there's times and places, and 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 yeah. maybe and maybe when the first tank got recalled, I should have buttoned it, and so that's that I can take on me. But still, um, I mean, it landed directly on the tank, right? It's not yeah. like I didn't have infantry around it. It was like four yeah. for one, boink. Try and, try and <laughs> yeah. soak five, five for two, boink, <laughs> like right on top of the tank. There's nothing you can do at that point. Uh, and so, but yeah, yeah, it happens. And the stacks and stacks. Yeah, that that's an amazing uh, game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that it, doesn't it, happen all the time. So that's but, where. But, it, and, and you know, it's it's not a, a lot of comfort when, when you're playing someone and they say, well, the only thing keeping me in this game is my sniper, right? Because I'm pretty much rolling them up. But, you know, every one of those wounded leaders coming through jungle, now I don't have double time capability. So that slows me down a hex every other turn, right? Uh, you don't have the, you don't have somebody close by to rally because he's just limping his way up because he can only move one hex through the jungle and advance. And so they're lagging the fight there. And it just it becomes very hard. And that's what happened. I just ran out of time. 
yeah. I just I couldn't do anything more. So, <laughs> so with your um, well, I I, I kind of I know you wrote an article or two. Do you have um, this? This yeah, one was yeah, the yeah. art, the science of the bonsai. Yeah, and so I had to. I, there's an error in that article, um, which was part of what started me writing my blog uh, because I couldn't fix it for you know, ten years. And when they put it out in the PDF, we tried to fix it and we couldn't get it fixed either. So there is a corrected article. Yeah, there is a corrected article on my blog for that. If you ask me later, I'll send you the link if you remind me. I think um, we, we have it. We, yeah, well, we have the blog. Yeah. Yeah, there's a small mistake I made in it re reference to one of the rules. And uh, I highlight the mistake I made on my blog and fix it. And then I have a second article that, that starts from the same position and shows a different bonsai that accomplishes what I tried to accomplish. But that's one, that, that, that article is what started me blogging because uh, you, you write rules-dense articles, mistakes are going to happen, oh, right? Yeah. Q&A are going to come up. People are going to come up with a different interpretation. Um, you're just going to miss a rule, right? And and I have a lot of really good people who who proofread my articles and technically edit my articles to make sure I'm on space. And still, mistakes happen. Um, and that one was one in the case as a case in point too. And so the error was mine, but it was published about I don't know three minutes when Melvin Falk said, "Hey, you got a mistake in it, dumbass." Um, and there's nothing <laughs> I could do, right? And there's nothing you can do. I noticed on your blog, you do encourage people to leave comments, to leave corrections. Yep. We do yep. it also. Yep. Um, sometimes, though, we hear like recently we heard from we don't check on the Facebook much at all. Right. Uh, maybe we, you know, we do have Jeff put us up there and, you know, right. there's so many other things to do in life. But um, someone put a comments in there. So then Mike Rizzi was monitoring it and let us know. But I, yeah, people, I love them. Just put it right we're gonna yeah. miss. We're gonna misspeak too. We yes. think we're saying this, but we're saying that. When I call my son Aaron, who's really his name is Adam, I do right. know he's Adam. <laughs> right, right. But, yeah, I know what I said in my head just because yeah. it came out of my mouth differently. It's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. So we really encourage people leave yeah. the comments. And Jeff and I are by no means um, yeah. proclaimed to study the game like you guys do. Yeah, yeah and and and. And I, you know, I spend a lot of time reading the rules. Uh, well, not a lot of time, but I mean, so what happened for me was I started playing when I first got back to DC and I started playing, obviously we were still getting at version one rules and the version two rules came out and I was working with Ola Bo, who was making a, our own um, uh, rule book for the PDF version. And so when I started with Ola, the rule book only had A through D plus O. And so I proofread A through D, actually it had A through D plus O and H, but H had no images in it. And so I, I proofread A through D for him and got most of the errors that were in there out. And a lot of those were greater thans and less thans and stuff that was weird. And then uh, I read through O, still not a CG guy, but I read through it and I tried my best and I added the tables into that. And then I scanned in all the images for chapter H and proofread that. And then I went back and... Um, used OCR, optical character recognition OCR, to scan in F, G, and then proofread F and G, then scanned in the images and proofread it again, and then um, worked my way through all of the um, campaign games. Uh, then I think Klaus, uh, Ola left, and Klaus Malmström. Klaus Malmström. And I kind of started doing it over, and Klaus has done most of the stuff since. Uh, I think I did Valor of the Guards, but Klaus has done most of it um, up through um, you know, the chapter Z stuff. So Edison Ridge, Kakuza Ridge, those kinds of things are now in there as well. Um, you know, and then adding a rat and whatnot. So that's what started me in this deep diving into the rule book was that, that need to read it. Um, I always tell people I didn't ever really read the rule book to play ASL until I'd played about 100, 150 games of actual ASL because I just don't think anybody's ready to read it at that point because it's just a, it's a textbook. And it's so just, someone was teaching you how to play? Like, yeah, so I was playing with friends in, 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 you know, either via play by email, which was the big early on with it, um, or face-to-face uh, -face with the DC conscripts. And I would read A and the parts that I needed or the stuff, and I'd understand the charts. And, I, you know, I would play a lot. John Slotwinski used to say, uh, play fast because it synergizes with playing often. Right. And so learn to play a little bit faster, to play a little bit more often. And I would just write down 
I mean, I think you, if you didn't see my blog post, I have like 13 notebooks filled with notes from games over the years that I played with questions. And obviously my earlier notebooks are a lot more filled than my later notebooks. But, you know, as I have a question, I would write it down and I would just play on. And then when I got home, I would read it up on that particular part of the rule. And then after after I played that 100 scenarios, then I sat down to start reading it. And then at the time I was proofing for Ola. And so those two worked hard by, you know, side by side. And um, now I've got rules in my head that are, that are uh, you know, associated with games, right? And, and I understand the context. And I could look at that and say, oh, crap. You know, there is a task check when you bog and a task check when you get immobilized. If you get hit again while you're immobilized, while you're bogged, it's a task check like as if an immobilization task check. And, you know, those kinds of things that I just didn't have any frame of reference. So, like, even today when we're playing, you know, with uh, Andy, it was like the you know the dredges your mind. He shoots an IFT shot or an, or an IFE shot on my guys, and he rolled rate of three, but his rate goes down by two. And you know how do you know that context, right? When that place was going on, and so being able to pull that rule, uh, it was is kind of silly, but you know that's how we do it is by 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 learning and and making mistakes and writing our mistakes down. And humans are basically experiential learners. Right? We don't learn by doing stuff right. We learn by doing stuff wrong. You know, some of us do it long for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes that emotional impact <laughs> when it's frustrating or it makes, like my friend wouldn't let me move the mortar out of a house in one of our early games. Like, you can't right. shoot a mortar out of a house. And I'm like, oh, well, can I just move it out now? And he's like, nope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you well, have to leave it. Like, seriously? But. I got mad and I remember don't put your mortar in the house. I know that's very basic, but and it's one of my first 10 games. So you have to remember my first, a lot of my games that I played against or against Gary Fortenberry. And so, you know, even when I do the right things, they're they're just wrong because he's just better player and, and, and squash it. Right. And it doesn't matter that you're sitting hauled down behind a wall and you took two shots and bounced it and he bowled up next to you point blank and rolled snake eyes. You still lose a burning tank. <laughs> right? And he'd do that over and over and over again. He would just say, hey, that's clean living. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you just kind of kind of roll with the punches. So when you started blogging, um, well, what other articles have you written for the journals and things? Or are they all accessible now so, on your blog? So, or what's so I've, only, I've only ever written one article for the journal. Okay, that's all I could find. Yeah, okay. yeah it was the only one that I ever wrote. Um, I've written a, another couple of articles um, in the Texas Bonsai Pipeline. Um, yes. But those, yes. Have, those have made it to my blog. I wrote a, one for the Hazardous Movement, put out the magazine. <laughs> so I wrote one for them. And there's now a couple of my... Has has the hazardous movements new? Correct. It's yeah, and I don't, I can't remember what it's called, but I, I in there I wrote a, a quick article about play testing and, you know what the you know what the role of a play tester is and how we go about doing it to try to make it um, there, and so I did that there, and then there's a couple of articles on uh, Chris Dory's blog, but those are things that he's taking off of my blog, but primarily most of my work is on on my blog. Um, I've put up, I think, uh, last count, I think it's 55 articles since September of last year, and they're anywhere from, you know, three to 30 pages. Uh, the big one is uh, the prisoner article that I, re- I wrote up there, which has got, um, you know, all the errata and examples of how you surrender or where you surrender or what you're doing and how that, um, and different pieces like that. And then there's a big one that just went into the LFT on attacking um that attacking article will be on my blog eventually. I told I told uh, Xavier, who runs LFT, that I would wait until you know at least as locked to post it, if not later. I want him to get some sales, and then I'll yeah. let him tell me when it's yeah. done. Right. And so uh, because uh, you know, I told him I said, and so this is back and forth between he and I. Because first of all, I hate waiting for stuff. I mean, I work so hard to get it done. I want people to read it. Uh, I'm a feedback junkie. And so having it having it sit, you know, inside of somebody's journal or somebody's article publication process for three, four or five years just doesn't work for me. Um, I just I couldn't live with that. I could I couldn't have it just sit there and think to myself, was it bad work or is it good work? Where's the feedback? Why? You know, how do we know what it is? Uh, and so uh, when I gave that big article to Xavier, I was like, well, when are you going to print? He's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, well, I'm not waiting 
So we had this big back and forth on the whole thing. And so he had scenarios ready and I was ready. And he said he would have it out probably in two months. I was like, okay, well, I'll, if it's that long, then I'll let you have it. And then we had the back and forth about what to do and what to do. And I was like, look, the only thing I really want for it is a PDF copy of the article. And then, you know, if you change the artwork, can I have the, can I use the artwork on my website so that I can make it look like what you've got? And so, you know, Xavier was gracious, gracious enough to give me that. Um, and, you know, and he also linked to my article and then he asked me for a couple more, you know, um, the ASL maxims um, in there because a lot of my attacking is based on a talk about how I make plans in this maxims article. And so when you're talking about plot tacking, you have to create a plan. And so giving that sort of background on it. And then uh, at the end, I had a really, um, it was just an introspective of what I, what I, why I blog and how I blog. And so that's the last page in that magazine. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I, we'll, have, I, we'll have to order a copy. Did yeah. when you do the article like that, uh, do you approach the magazines? Do they call so, you or? How, how? So Xavier um, asked me if I had. I shared with him. So when I was writing my prisoners article, um, Xavier shared with me that one of the guys in house was writing one on his side as well, and so. Um, mine was going to come out earlier and he was trying to see if I would publish that one with him because I was closer and our articles looked kind of the same. Um, but I just wanted to stay with my blog at that point in time. Uh, I'm not, I don't have anything against, you know, print medium or print, print magazines. I just, I don't, I'm happy to have anybody that wants to publish any of my work is certainly welcome to do so you know, chat with me, we'll work it out. I'm not looking for money. Nobody's getting rich off of these. There's not enough money yeah. in it to begin with. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, he and I were having discussions and then Toby put out his defense manual and then Toby and I were having discussions about the defense and Xavier was involved in it. And then I had put out, Toby had mentioned in in the in a interview that he did with um, the guys from uh, the, uh, the, the other two guys. Yeah. Dave and Martin, whatever I can't, I can't remember what it's they call it. Illuminating, illuminating rounds. Illuminating yeah, rounds. Toby, yeah, Toby had the discussion in illuminating rounds, and he said that you know a def a, an offensive manual needed to be written, uh, but he was never going to do it. And then I know Mark Pitcavage had mentioned before that he might just get around one day to writing it himself. And I still think there's plenty of room for either of those guys should they want to do it. Right? This, it, I'm under no illusions that I've written the de the definitive manual on how to attack. Right. Um, yeah, but, and and the more we people, us normal people, ordinary people, average people, the more but, I read it. If it's yours and then it's someone else's, it's still going to help it stick in my head somehow. So, yeah, and so Toby mentioned the need to do it, and then you know I started writing down you know, what 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 does my attack look like? How do I how do I go about it? How would I do this discussion? And as as I was writing the article, it got kind of long, but it focused on you know pregame in game and post game and uh then i had a couple people proofread what i had done and just give me a good read and they kept talking about the post game not fitting in and doesn't make any sense and i kept trying to jam it in and they kept saying it doesn't work and i kept trying to jam it in and so finally i took it out because that post game was really all about um humans and how they learn and how i had done some research on learning and part of my belief is, is that to be a better attacker there's a bunch of stuff you got to do but you have to learn as part of the process and if you're not learning then you're not getting better and if you're not getting better then it's going to be hard and so i sort of bolted that into there um, but i was convinced to take it out and i think <clears throat> i think the article was better for it and I turned that into an article on it my could, blog about, you know, how to learn and, you know, yeah. what it goes about. And then that's where I talk about my notebooks and my approach and how I go at it. And, you know, everybody talks about, well, I'm an experiential learner or I'm a visual learner or I'm a, no, we're all multifaceted yeah. learners. There yeah, is no, right. there is no yeah. one way people learn. We learn across all of them. And I'm like, you know, and this is great because moving counters is a tactile experience, which is one way to learn and writing things down is, you know, another way to learn and visually is another way to learn. And so dude, we're playing ASL and we got all of these things at our disposal. So, you know, you just have to be deliberate in your need to learn and your willingness to learn and it'll happen. 
And so, you know, that that was the post game. But if you read the article in the print article at one point, you'll see that I talk about the pre, the post, or the pre, the end, and the post game. And then I never do the post game in the in the in the actual magazine article because I was like, oops, I forgot to make that change and I ripped that piece out. So, um, you know, I posted that link as part of that. You know, this is a accompanying article to that blog or to that then, article. And then, like graphics for yours, you, you referenced that they may make different ones at LFT than what you oh, produce for oh, your own. Or? So the LFT guys did a really good job, and I think they're you know they're probably playing the is this copyright or is this not copyright game, right? So um, their in-house editor really, uh, I had pictures of games that I was playing uh, or bits and excerpts from games and. I was using Vassal, obviously, to cut and paste them in because that's where I was playing the games. And their in-house artists went ahead and just redrew the whole, all of those by hand, right? And the counters and moved around. And so they look, they look amazing, um, but they're just, they're not standard artwork, but, you know, they convey the same thing. And so he, you know, they did a lot of work like that. They use their own little counters. Um, just, you know, who knows what the rules are. And I so, think, yeah, something about, they, like, everyone has to make their own uh, version of the people on the counter kind of thing. Yeah, I know, uh, I yeah, I, before I started working um, and doing my stuff, I called the the Basil guys and asked about their copyright and how they work it to make sure I was compliant with what they do. Um, and for the most part, I'm not collecting, I don't collect any money. And so because I don't collect any money, I'm not really violating anybody, okay. uh, you know, or any of their, of their copyrights, but I do tra you know, keep track of it. I've one time, one time solicited money and all I really said was, hey, when I posted my prisoner's article, I said, if you enjoy it, you enjoy my work, here's a GoFundMe that Sam Tyson put up and that's to fund an HTTPS cert uh, certificate for the Vazel.info or, or whatever Vazel dot whatever it is that he runs and then the Vazel server itself. And oh. so Sam needed money for that. And so people donated to his GoFundMe and that, that was it. I mean, I, oh. I've never I've never taken any money. I don't need it. You know, I'm, I'm retired. My life is good. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, I wish I could have contributed to that. We didn't hear about that. But um, so then um, you tournament wise, you well, it's finished with the blog. So what if I, I'm a rookie? Do you have anything I should read first on your blog or then what would be the best things you think we should read on your blog or? Um, oh, I, I think all of it's good, but yeah, uh, <laughs> it just it depends on what you're what you're where you're at, where you're at and what you're struggling with. Right. Because I try to. So topics, I, I troll Facebook, I talk to people, I have lots of guys, I sit on Discord, um, I've played lots of games, I've got 13 notebooks of questions that came up in my lifetime and where, where it came from at different stages. And so I see repeated questions and different parts and pieces and those are what usually make fodder for what I'm okay. doing. Uh, most of my articles are really short. Uh, my original purpose was to keep my articles to less than three pages. Or when I talk to about rules, I usually try to stay to three written pages and then I'll jam my articles or pictures into it. So I, I talk about bounding first fire and how to do it or uh, gun dudes and how to do it and what they look like with examples. Uh, you know, how do you really, how do you, how do you correct OBA? Cause I see a lot of people correct OBA wrong. Right. And so just focusing on that one box inside of the OBA flowchart and how it comes together and how to do it. Um, I do uh, sometimes I've started branching out into uh, scenario reviews like um, uh, how would I attack on this scenario or how would I defend on this scenario um, to give people you know ideas with that. So it just it just depends on where you're at in the process. And then obviously there's a contact me on my blog and there's a request, um, a topic up there. So if there's something you want to see me write about, you know, you can contact me there or you can, you know, same time me on Facebook or whatever and I'll, I'll take a look at it. I don't always write the articles, but because I spend a lot of time and over, what I have been doing a lot is collecting places where literature exists. Ah. And so if I find an article that I know will cover your topic, I, if I don't write it myself, I'll send you to that one. Uh, I get calls uh, uh, every now and then to write, um, you know, what about Overrun? And I'm like, well, if you've read Crosstown Traffic from Carl Maguera, there's nothing left for me to tell you, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so go read that because <laughs> uh, yeah. there's no sense in rewriting that article. It's just, and would it's, that, that would have been in the uh, fanzine that, that he writes most of? No, no, uh, Crosstown. 
Crosstown Traffic, I think, is in Journal 9 or Journal okay. 10. I'd have to look it up, but it's in well, one yeah. of the journals. Um, yeah. I think it's in Journal 9 or Journal 10. Yeah, Maybe I need to just go back and reread all of the articles. I was telling Jeff, I said, you know, I would sit on the couch and pour over these things when they came in right. and then not play right away. And right. then I'm thinking, oh, I think there's an, I think this guy I wrote for the journal was talking wow. about how to do a bounding machine gun thing and then bring your right. tank. And I wish I could remember now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so and, and that's the thing, right? And that's part of the reason why I try to keep my stuff to three pages because if they're big, dense, twenty-page articles, it's hard to remember what's going on. And by making them just these small, focused pieces, I hope that you you know you walk away. So I may have just a half a page to a page discussing the rules, and then two and a half pages of examples of that in play. Um, and so you'll find that in 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 all of them. I did I did a series of like I think. Four articles on defending against sleaze freeze. Mm -hmm. Right, just how do you how do you defend against sleaze freeze? What does street fighting look like? What are your in hex options like? What are your out of hex options look like? What happens if you're on the second floor looking down and it's now an open top vehicle and it's burning in your hex? And you know, uh, I came up with lots of ways on 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 how to do that because it's such a prevalent topic. Uh, so, yeah. you know, there, but again, those are all just you know three to four pages and you know wrote them as a series. Um, I, I think I might take my defensive patterns right now that sits at about 15 pages and break that up into one with uh, an idea of of what the objectives of my of my defending is, like this is what I'm trying to do, and no matter what the thing is, and then I might talk about then uh, break each of the patterns up. I think I have like eight or nine patterns, break them up into one article of a paragraph, and then just you know, go into and out, go in and grab random scenarios and say, okay, here's how I would use the, that that particular pattern in this scenario, right? Spreading across here or in, acting in this way or behaving here in that or in that fashion. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. It's sitting on my desktop here. You know, um, I have to give some thought to it. Uh, it's got to be something that that is digestible and understandable, right? And that's my big key is digestible and understandable and and. Thankfully, I've got a lot of guys who I work with um, who are at all levels, right? So beginners to advanced players. And so it, it's really comforting to me when I give something to an advanced player and he says, yeah, I kind of understand this, but it's more uh, encouraging to me when I give it to a new guy and he says, oh yeah, this is awesome. It makes sense, right? It's direct. It tells me things that I, you know, that I need to know and how to go places. And I find those are always just encouraging. Do you find yourself uh, learning new stuff as you're researching the article, learning stuff that you you didn't quite have a grasp of? Uh, occasionally. Um, not as often as I would hope, but occasionally. Um, and it's not it's not it's not that it's not there to learn. It's just, you know, teaching an old dog new tricks, right? Is sometimes not an easy thing. Uh, but it, it is always interesting to me when when they have these discussions. Um, I find every now and then Klaus and I will disagree on stuff because Klaus is one of my biggest contributors. Um, and obviously you you disagree with Klaus at your own peril because <laughs> um, he he he's probably forgotten more about the rule book than most of us will ever know. Uh, and 99 times out of 100, he's been right. But I think I've got him once, maybe <laughs> twice. But it doesn't happen very often. That's like Rich Spilkey in our world. Usually yeah. we he's usually right, but... Um... <laughs> Yeah, Spooky's also the guy who's very knowledgeable, um, you know, and all of the charts that he's made it over the years have, has been his path of, of how to how to contribute back. Um, yeah, and and then again, forcing himself to look at all those variables and all those factors and try to put them into one place, you know. Also, it's nice. And I actually take that back. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, Joe Arthur taught me it taught me a rule recently. We were playing again with the Aberdeen guys and uh, an AA machine gun in bounding first fire only pays uh, a plus one die roll modifier. Um, I thought it would pay non turreted plus three in addition to the plus two. And um, <laughs> that's not that's not located anywhere on any any official MMP chart. But if you look at the rat charts, if you have them, you will see there yeah. is a there is a plus one on that particular on that particular AA machine gun. And I was like, no, Joe, you're wrong. And Joe's like, no, I'm pretty sure I'm right. And I'm like, no, Joe, you're wrong. But I'll tell you what, we'll humor you and we'll pull up the rule book, right? And I'm like, all, oh, all, oh, like, you know, like a like a professor with my tweed jacket, and my pipe going, oh, let me show you. And he was right. 
So, yeah, I was like, hmm, wow, there's a slice of humble pie. So, yeah, I mean, it happens. Yeah, but you've studied it so much, it's going to not happen much. I can go back and reread, you know, lots of sections and kind of go, oh, yeah, that's something I used to kind of know. And then somehow we stopped playing it that way, right? Or I forgot that and need to be reminded again. Yeah, for me, the... To, for me, the, the big thing is where I really, when I struggle, it's because there's two rules that disagree or you don't know how, how to handle them or they don't make sense when you consider them together. So like I, I've always struggled with disruption. So a disrupted unit, you can move right through its hacks. But if you declare no quarter, it now, wrote, it now routes normally. So should it now, should you still be allowed to move through that unit's hacks because you can't move through a normal broken unit's hacks? Yeah, that's right. And so, and so, and so, while the rules would say, yeah, you can do it, and I agree that if we're playing by the rules, you would have to, but to me, it doesn't make sense. Um, and so, you know, that if, if somebody ever rewrites A20 and we get, you know, an official rewrite of prisoners, then I hope they address that particular thing. Um, in my opinion, it should, you shouldn't be able to move through a text once you declare no quarter. Um, but, you know, I know that. Uh, having discussions with Perry, he was of the opinion that it should be able to, although there was no Q&A issued on it. Um, I just left it as it is because the rules are there. But, you know, it's it's things like that that are that are subtle in the rules that, that, that I just don't sometimes have a hard time with. Because the exceptions, the, it's easy to remember things that are the same. It's when you get to those exceptions that they're hard. And then calling them up under the heat of battle as you're playing, and you're both sitting here back and forth diving in, and you're looking for a rule that's hidden someplace. So can a unit use a DC and a flamethrower in the same turn? Can a unit use two flamethrowers in the same turn? The answer is no, but it's buried in the DC rules. Okay. <laughs> so good luck Good luck finding that. I was going to guess no, because I haven't yeah. seen anyone do it. Therefore, yeah, it must but, be no. But it's buried in the DC rules, the fact that you can't use there. two flamethrowers. And so it's there, but you just it's hard to find it. Yeah, see, it, it should be under the flamethrower also, and right? And well, you'd think it would be on the support weapon usage table that says you can only use one. Oh, but, yeah. But, right. but it's not there either. Okay. <laughs> so it's just, it's those are the things that, that I struggle with, those one off. And, and, and I like the way you're kind of thinking of trying to uh, think of what it represents, the, what the rule represents happening. Right. Right. So I could see where if the squad is now heard that there's no quarter. Right. Uh, he's, I can imagine he right. would not want you to pass through his hex anymore. Right. And now that I said that, I'm probably going to want to play it that way. Yeah, and that, and that's, but that's the thing that I, like I said, those are the things I struggle with, right? I mean, I'm 10 guys and we're not happy about the world, but you just killed Joe and 14 of his closest friends and we're going to let you come into our space? No, I don't yeah. think so. Yeah, right? you but, know, yeah. Right? In the old days, uh, they've, only, they've only recently fixed it, but um, an escaped unit, a prisoner, which is escaped, so he's not an escaped unit, is good order, and he's always good order. And if he was a squad size and it was sitting inside of a fortified location, you couldn't enter it even though he was armed. Now, they've subsequently eradicated that recently because there was that problem in the rules. Um, but, you know, there it was. Uh, you look at, uh, who was the one that was just a recent rule? Uh, it's in the, uh, in the um, comprehensive route chart. There's a rule in there that if you read through the comprehensive ch route chart, every rule in there has got a rules reference to it except for this one rule, and it talks about removing a CC counter when there's no enemy unit in your hacks. Used to, the, the rule says if you end up, if you advance into each other's hacks, uh, and this comes relevant during a movement phase, you place a CC counter, and then the ASOP says you take the CC counter off after advance. But if you're marked with a CC counter, nobody can advance. Well, the only place where it says to take it off is buried inside of that ASOP, inside of that comprehensive route example. And in that comprehensive route example, it doesn't have a reference to any rule. And the reason it doesn't have a reference to any rule is because that comprehensive route example was written under version one uh, rules. And it was based on a version one Q&A that Tom Repetti used. Or was it Tom Repetti who wrote that article? Or Scott Romanowski, I can't remember which. But whoever wrote that article, they used that rules reference, that Q&A reference for a reason to remove that Q&A counter. And so that history and lineage to find that particular rule, you know, again, how are you going to find it? 
right? How do you find that? Because tip, if my unit bonsais into your hex, that hex gets marked with a CC counter. If I leave that CC counter on until after advance phase, because it doesn't come off until the CC phase, then that unit can't advance. So you want to keep me stuck there. You just break and rat away and you're stuck there, right? But by Q and A, oh, even without an opponent in the hex, the CC. Now, that's counters? that's the way the rules are written. Are supposed to be written, mm -hmm. but, I, but but there is a Q and A which corrects it. That talks about how it should be, and then buried inside of that comprehensive rule, that comprehensive route example, is one little example that says the CC counter is removed because there's no other enemy unit in your face in your hex, right? And so the examples are the rules, and the rules are the examples. But there is no rule that says remove that counter. There's Q and A which was version one Q&A, which in theory was deprecated, yeah. but Perry, Perry um, and I had a discussion and he verified that that particular Q&A still counts. And I posted that as part of this article I did recently on, okay, on, the, close on, combat. on, on the close combat counters and how to move it and whatnot. Um, because I was like, well, wait a minute. The, there's no, there is no rule that says when to remove it. It's like ASOP step 834.B, which is after advance. So if you're marked with a CC counter, you can't advance. Yeah, because uh, I saw the CC article, and I and I I'm so basic to where I would skip putting the CC because it was gonna go to melee. Right. I just had sloppy play for quite a long time. Yeah. When when it was just you know one guy teaching me, and then I'm teaching four other guys. There's no one else to teach me. Yeah, and for the and most part, for the sloppy. most part, it's just a, it's just a distinction. It's a difference, not a distinction. You know, there's not really that much of an issue with around it. Um, I think as long as you're as long as you're placing the CC counter at the ends of your bonsais and whatnot, so you can recognize that you're not able to advance, right? Because that's what I see people do. They'll they'll I, I need to, I'll bonsai into your hex, and mm -hmm. the victory condition is one hex beyond, and all I have to do now is advance in, and yay, I win. Well, no, you're marked with the CC counter. You can't advance, and I didn't break and run away because if I break and run away, then you can advance. And so, um, you know, those are the as long as you're doing that, and generally you're pretty much okay. Um, there are some other weird off opportunities. If you CC reaction fire and don't kill your enemy tank, then you're marked with a CC vehicle saying that you can't use a specific type of CC reaction fire. Um, oh. But but you know, <laughs> they're, 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 but for the most part, you know, it's not a it's not something that's that's going to make or break your games, generally speaking. But that advancing part, but I don't even remember if Jeff, were we putting CC counters on all our bonsai charges when we get in there? I don't even remember. Don't when we played a ton yeah, a year did. ago on Vassal right. Right. And I actually Pacific. Yeah, the trick is, the, the biggest thing is you just can't advance when you're marked with a CC counter. And so when you bonsai or you human wave or you, you berserk charge into the hex, you're marked with a CC counter. Um, and that's what you know makes the decision where to go. And so... You know, I wrote yeah. that one because class was after me to write it. He kept asking me to write one on CC because he keeps getting questions on it. And so uh, uh, he had written, he had pulled together most of the rules. In fact, probably almost all the rules minus the Q&A. And then, uh, you know, I, I put that together just because he does so much for me. And my ability to give him one back is, you know, the least of what I could do. Yeah, for sure. Now, I did notice that you are like the um, champion of the 2018 Human Wave Tournament. Is uh, that the mini tournament? I don't I remember. Have, I, I might have been. I have a picture of you accepting an award for that. Yeah, so that, I, I might have been. I don't remember. Um, but So you don't do a lot of um, – you did say you go to some tournaments. So I go to a lot of tournaments. And so, like, I've finished – third at ASLOC um, in the Grow Faz, uh in one year. And then I've won the Texas team tournament in like, I don't know, back-to-back -back years. But now I go I go to play people I've never met before and people I've never played before. So like, uh, I really enjoyed going to England. Uh, I went to the Blackpool to Heroes um, this earlier this year and I played Toby Pelling again, who I've, I've only ever played a couple of times. But I also got to play, um, you know, a lot of the local um, ASL, you know, I don't know what you want to call them. Uh, you know, they're best, the, the, the best players in England. I got to, they were at the tournament, you know, the, uh, by their ladder. And I got to play against all of those guys and I uh, had a great time. I think I went four and five or four and two. I can't remember what it was, but, uh, you know, I played very well. But, you know, that wasn't a tournament play. That was just me sitting down and playing games with folks because I wanted to play games with them. 
Um, so, you know, I got to play uh, Martin Vicka, Vinny. So you hear him sometimes called the Vinny. I played Martin Vicka. I played Mark, uh, Martin Vicka, Mark Blackmore, I think. Blackmore, I think his name is. Uh, I played Ian. I played, you know, you know, a lot of their, just, you know, the by their Crusader ladder, they were like, I don't know, the top seven players. I think I got to play five out of the top seven. And, you know, and it's not even always playing the best players. I, I just enjoy playing people I've never played before. Um, I've thought about going to Italy, but so my wife and I are going to the UK to, uh, relatively soon. My daughter's coming over and she wants to go over to see the Harry Potter world in the UK. And so we're going to go over and, and see that with her. Um, otherwise, I would be going to Double One, which is next month because there's a different crowd in London than showed up at, at um, Blackpool. But uh, Blackpool also does um, bounding, I think they call it bounding first fire or yeah, you know, yeah. so they do they do that bounding first fire tournament in November at the same place, and it's a great venue. So if you get a chance to go to Blackpool to either Heroes or Bounding Fire, I highly recommend it. The venue's great. The hotel there, um, basically, they've shut down for the season when these guys show up, and so they open it up just for the ASL crowd. There's nobody else in the building that are, aren't yeah. ASLers. Uh, they bring in food, um, have a on you know, there's no real need to leave, and it's a very reasonably priced. Um, very, very reasonably priced. Uh, easy hop, I mean, depending on how you get there, a train. I mean, so I've been in Europe now for two and a half years. So for me, getting around by train is pretty easy. I got all the mobile apps that allows me to order my tickets and things. Um, and so I've kind of sort of sorted that out. So it was an easy fly for me into uh, uh, what is it called? Not Chelsea. I can't remember the name of the city, but there's a football team there. But it was an easy flop into that. And then, you know, another 20 minutes on the train and, you know, a two-minute walk and right there to Blackpool. Nice. So, so I loved it. Cool. Indeed. Well, we're getting on about an hour here, so maybe we should start to kind of wrap things up, I suppose. I, with all your knowledge on these articles, I'm, I just – Maybe you'd be willing to come back in uh, six months or something and sure. do a deep dive on on a, one of those articles. Uh, sure, sure. Make it verbal if, so people can hear it while they're driving. Sure. sure. If there's one you want to chat about, not, not a problem. Like all of them? Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully <laughs> so, let's, let's do it after hockey season. I'm a huge, oh, sure. Ranger, I'm a huge Rangers fan, and so the games don't start here until 2 o'clock in the morning, and I've been staying up to watch them. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and, and we, and we, we say this a lot. It takes us a long time to get to anything, so it would probably end up being easily a long time from now because we have all the other things we want to do too. But uh, but that would be fascinating because I'm so fascinated just listening to it to you talk about this. So. Yeah, um, I'll be back. Uh, I don't know if you guys are going to Aslock, but I'll definitely be going to Aslock probably for the whole week, um, just because it's the only way to make sense for coming from here um, back to there. So um, yeah, my current my current plan is to go to Aslock for that for sure. Um, I'll be back in the U.S. for my uh, grandson's birth, um, in quarter three, quarter four. I'll let my daughter tell that story, but you know it's coming. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, and we can always know, call you there in Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, and you, you can send. Yeah, my email. Obviously, you can send me an email message, and we you can chat that way, and you know, and work something out. Um, pretty easy. And then again, obviously, if there's something you want to write or see me talk about, or you know, cover my blog. Um, again, you have my email, or you can just go into the blog and, and use the contact form, and you know, be happy to you know think about it. Uh, if I don't write about it, I can certainly try to send you a link to an article or something that covers the topic for you. So, okay. and that goes for all our listeners. You all heard that, didn't you, listeners? So, yeah, yeah. And Aaron. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, how do we find your blog? Where do we go? Um, so it's on the web. Uh, you can find it under either the bishop says.com or the bishop says.org. Um, um, but those are just domain redirects to my Jekyll domain. So J E K L J E K L.com. Okay. I was um, wondering where that uh, came from. Yeah. yeah, we'll, yeah link, it, we'll link that those up. Are, those are, I own those domains or domain redirects, but in order to, in order to have that hosted at my web at my web provider, they want another like five hundred bucks a month or something like that, and I'm just not paying that much for it. <laughs> it was a ridiculous cost. Uh, when I when I when I got the service with them, I think I paid them. It was a hundred dollars for one year or a hundred and five dollars for three years. And so, being a you know a sound econ economist, I went with the three years for five hundred and five. But now, in order to 
to have them actually host those other two domains, I have to pay them to do something more. And now all of a sudden it becomes, you know, eight times as expensive. Yeah. So because I own the domains and I can, I use the registrar, I can, I just put domain redirects on them. So you can go to either one of those and that'll get you to Jekyll. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. All, all right, right then. Well, well, thank you very much. To, okay. Thank you. And we'll sign yeah, off. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thanks. Take Bye. care guys. Have a good night. All right. Bye, Jim. Thanks so much.